Ah, good morning. So you want to be disturbed. <laughs> Sick bunch. <laughs> it's the 11 o'clock. But hey, we might as well start with a really graphic illustration. We're talking about mission today. We've been going for a few weeks talking about redefining the church. We've been talking about our vision and values. We've talked about church, identity, community, and mission. Okay, everybody say the word mission. You know, it was a great time. I mean, when you see like these first responders, you see people running for their lives, and you see first responders going into it. That, that to me is just a captivating picture. Or my brother, who was on his last year before he retired from the army, uh, and he had been on tours, you name it, he had been everywhere and saw a lot of action, a lot of battle. Uh, you know, got beat up pretty good. And then uh, at the 25-year mark, you know, it was time to, time to coast. It was time to, you know, just rest. And, hey, just bide this last year out. And then you retire and get all your bennies and all that kind of stuff. And he went in and talked to his chief or whoever the guy was. And he said, sign me up. I want to go back to Afghanistan. And they said, are you crazy? You have one year, you know, take this desk job over there and, you know, manage some, some vehicles, you know, and then, then you're done. He goes, with all due respect, that's not what I signed up for. And he went back to Afghanistan. He, pay, he paid the price, you know, and he, you know, he's, got, he's got some scars to prove it. That's what mission-minded people do, you know. That's what mission-minded Christians do. You know, God doesn't need a bunch of weak terrified Christians on this planet. That's not doing him any good. You know, a bunch of little, oh, Jesus, come back quickly. He's not coming back quickly. He's not coming back until the gospel has been preached to every ethnic group in the whole world. He's not coming back. So save those little prayers, those little, I'm afraid, come quickly, Jesus, so I can go sit on a cloud with a harp and an angel and the spend the rest of eternity doing that. that, that that's not his will. Disturbed? <laughs> I'll give you another picture. Yeah. Think about this before you go to brunch. There's a public pool. Public pool. And this kid, I saw this a few years ago. This impression doesn't leave my mind, though. It keeps recycling back. And this kid, little kid's out there in his little floaties, and he starts yakking in the pool. And just blah, blah, vomiting, man. And it's like all over. And everybody in the pool is bolting out of the pool. And then you see one figure bolting in the pool. Who do you think was bolting in the pool? No, dad. No, it was mom. I so wanted, I so wanted to say dad, but it was mom. You know why? Because her kid was more important than the yak in the pool. And she got right in the middle of it and rescued him out. That's the gospel. That's the gospel. What's my calling? What's my gifting, God? What am I equipped to do, God? Go into the yak of life and drag people out to the throne of God. That's God's will. Now, if you have another gospel, let me know. Let's sit down. You can buy me coffee. We can talk. We can debate. That's it in the essence. That's what Jesus did. He who knew no sin, not only touched sin, but became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. He got the yak. He got your yak on him, in him. He became that, and the great exchange took place. Our sin for his righteousness, and that's why you and I can go boldly to the throne of grace and find mercy and help in our time of need. Got any needs? Come boldly. Oh, man, that's the mission. That's mission. I'm a little wi wired today. I'll just, I'll, you know what? I'm, I'm a little amped. Part of it is I'm, I'm convicted by scripture. I'm guilty for miss times this week that I missed God. Uh, so I got all that converging. I got some coffee at work. Um, yeah. So let's talk about it. Okay. Let's read this verse. This is our foundational verse. If you haven't been here in the last three, four weeks, uh, how many of you have not, you weren't here last week. Can I see your hands? Where were you? Let's start with you back there. Yeah, you. The one, you're looking down like this. Yeah. Where, where, what was so busy and important that you had to not? I'm kidding. Let's read that. I'm kidding. Let's, let, let's read this together. Ready? And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Who said that? How do you know? The letters aren't in red, but it's Jesus, right? 
He said that. Whose church is it? Jesus' church. It's always the right answer. Come on, I tell you that every time. The answer is always Jesus. Whose church is it? Who's building it? Okay, but you and I have been graciously invited in to be a part of his activity on the planet. It's a beautiful thing. And you know what I love about this? So, so we talked about identity. you got to go back and listen to the messages. They're just really deep and profound and practical. Look at those two words right there. And I tell you, you are Peter. You are. You know what I love about that? Jesus is giving Peter his identity. Jesus is saying, you are Peter. Now let me tell you something. When you and I get our identity from Jesus, we don't have to look any other place for it. If you don't get your identity from Jesus, you will look other places for it. You will, you, will, you will look at your life and you will say, if I have a lot of money in the bank, I'm successful, and that'll become your identity. Or if I drive a certain car, I'm successful. That's who I am. If I have possessions, if my approval rating is up, if I have a lot of Facebook friends and I get a lot of likes for my little picture I take of my little meal, and a bunch of people give me the thumbs up, then I feel good about myself. That's my identity. And then if you don't get that, you feel depressed. Or if people have an opinion about you, or they criticize you, or they talk behind your back, you just melt down because you don't know who your identity is in Christ. That's a, listen, Jesus is speaking words of life to Peter. He doesn't define Peter by his past. He doesn't define Peter by his um, past successes or in impetuous failings and shooting off his mouth. Um, he doesn't even define Peter by his potential. That's not how he was defined. That's not, he, that's not how you get defined. You're not defined by God. Your identity is not in your sin. It's in his obedience and righteousness. You're not identified by your addiction. You're not identified by your struggle. You're not, you're not identified by your last big sin. You're not even identified by your, your, your last big obedience. That's true. Now, see, you got to get this. You need a revelation. You don't just me to tell you. You need God to breathe on you and tell you, you're my son, you're my daughter, and nothing can, can change that at all. This is who you are. This is your identity. You know what I love about this right here? I love the fact that Peter gets it. I mean, he gets it. For a guy who didn't get a lot of it, I mean, seriously, man, he missed it a lot. He got this. How do you know he got this? Because of the words that he tells the church in 1 Peter chapter 2. That's a sign. This is what Peter tells the church. Now, you got to remember, he's telling the church, okay? The church is not a building. Never really has been. The church is always the called out ones. It's the assembly. It's the people. It's never a place geographically. It's never a building. Even though we like to do that, people like to build buildings so we have something to show for our efforts. See, there's a cross and stained glass and there's a building and it's beautiful and look what we did. But you got to go to the, like uh, 250 AD to find the earliest architecture or the, yeah, dig, architecture. Is that what I don't know what they call it. Archaeology. Got it. <laughs> earliest archaeological digs to find the first kind of building, church building, and it was really nothing more than a really big house, but it had, you know, engravings and all that stuff that said it was a church. So the church, you get, we get away from it that it's not a building, it's a people. You see, this building, as nice as it is, whatever, um, it's a place. No, seriously, I, you know what? I just, buildings do zip for me. I'm just telling you. You bulldoze this thing where a fire comes through this and tears this to the ground, the church has not been touched because it's the people. And we show up here next week and, wow, there's no walls. Hey, let's worship God. And people drive by and they go, look at all those people outside worshiping. Who are they? That's the church. That's the church. That's who we're called to be. We're called to be the church. It's the people. I've known people that started a church under a palm tree in Hawaii and met week after week after week, month after month after month, under palm trees. And that was the church. I have, friend, I have a friend that planted a church in a bar. You got to be led by the Spirit on that one. <laughs> yeah, no, he did. He went to the guy and said, hey, Sundays, I want to have church. You guys, hopefully you're not open that early. And uh, they arranged it, started a church in the bar. Crazy. 
That's the church. Church isn't the bar building. It's the people. If you follow Jesus, you're part of the church globally. You're an international person. It's the church. Jesus said, I'm going to build my church. And Peter gets it. You are Peter. And on this rock, the revelation that Christ is Lord I'm going to build that church on that revelation. Jesus is the cornerstone. How do we know Peter got it? By what he says to the church in 1 Peter, also known as the diaspora, the scattered ones. Because you remember, Acts chapter 1, Holy Spirit comes. Acts chapter 2, power. Everybody's on fire for Jesus. They get together. People are getting saved. Tongues go out. Everybody's hearing the interpretation of the gospel in their own tongue. All kinds of crazy stuff. Signs, wonders, healings, miracles, all these kinds of things. Acts 2, they get together. They, uh, they just get together. They love each other. They give all their money away. They give their properties away. They share their food. They share doctrine. They share prayer. They share the Lord's table. They share all this kind of stuff. And everything is going absolutely awesome. And then all of a sudden, there's this dude named Saul. And Saul's got a bad attitude. Saul's a Jewish leader who hates Christians. And Saul comes and just starts killing people, and he starts with Stephen, Acts chapter 5, 6, and 7. <clears throat> Stephen preaches. They kill him. The church scatters, and here's what it says. And the church was scattered into Judea and Samaria, and the gospel went out and was preached everywhere. See, these are people, they weren't scared. They, yeah, they were scattered, but they weren't scared because they preached the gospel. And when they preached the gospel, there were signs and there was miracles and there was healings that take place. And so when Peter, you know, writes this letter to these groups of people that are just, you know, scattered all over, interesting what he does is he speaks identity to them in 1 Peter chapter 2. And this is what he says. And I would tell you, I would encourage you, meditate on these verses. If your identity is shaky, if you don't know who you are, if you're stuck in performance loops and perfectionism and all that, you got to let the word of God shape who you think you are. And this is what Peter said. I love this. He says, but you are, not you was, not you're going to be. He said, you are, you are a chosen people. Marinate on that for a while. Chosen people. Who are you chose by? God. Who called you out? God. Your church, you're called out. You're chosen. You're a royal priesthood. Are you kidding me? You mean you and I have the privilege to stand between God and people and bring the presence of God, the love of God, the fruit of the Spirit of God to people? You get to take people's concerns to the throne of God? That's an incredible thing. A royal priesthood. You're more than a Christian with a bumper sticker. Oh, my gosh. If you have one, get rid of it, please. No, I'm serious. I'll do it for you, seriously. Mm, Move on, Bob. Royal priesthood, chosen, holy nation, a people belonging to God. You know all you really need to know? You belong to God. If you don't know anything else, you belong to God. That'll get you through a lot. That'll get you through really hard times. That'll get you through a lot of trials, a lot of turmoil, a lot of brokenness, a lot of pain. Belong to God that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful, marvelous light. Do you remember the darkness you came from? Can you look back and just remember how dark it was? Now, some of you, you might have been raised in the church, you know. Oh, it wasn't dark for me. Well, if you didn't know Jesus and you were in religion, it was darker than dark. Ah, Jesus said some stuff about that. But marvelous light. Ooh, this is identity. Once you were not a people, you were just a bunch of scattered people, man. Fragmented people. You are now the people of God. Oh, love it. The people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you received mercy. Mercy, the active desire to remove distress. You and I were distressing. We were distressed before we knew Jesus. Absolutely distressed. Ephesians said that before you knew God, you were dark. You were in darkness. You were darkness. You were dead in trespasses and sin. 
That was your life. Alienated from God. Without God and without hope. And let me just say, if you don't have God, you don't have hope. And then it says, but. Thank God for the buts in the Bible. (laughs) But now you have received mercy. You have received mercy. And he has made you alive in Christ. You got a pulse. (laughs) You got a beating heart because of the mercy of God. Now think about church for a minute here. You think about church, you think about buildings, you think about edifices. I was in Spain on my way to Greece last summer, and I went to a place called Sagrada Familia. It's a church that's been under construction for over 100 years. It's an incredible, I mean, if you're into architecture and you're into design and church buildings and all that, it is absolutely spellbinding and captivating. It, It causes you to just go, wow, amazing. And it's a church. Show me another picture. That's from the inside. That's from my iPhone looking up. This church is 170 feet tall. Give me another one if we have one. I mean, it's absolutely, and this is all over, stained glass, the story of the Gospels. And it's absolutely beautiful. But you know what? It costs $25 million a year to keep construction and maintain it. And as beautiful and ornate as it is, you know what I think? When Jesus looks at that, he doesn't really, I'm not sure he sees a church. I'm thinking, Jesus is thinking, $25 million will feed a lot of poor people. $25 million will send a lot of missionaries to unreached people groups. That's what, that's what I'm thinking. And then you think, you know, one or two earthquakes can level that thing. That's not what makes it a church. Remember, the church is a gathered group of people, an assembly under the lordship of Jesus Christ. Here's what a church looks like. This is a group of people I get to speak to through the internet, love the internet, in Pakistan. And different churches, one place actually does have a rented space. A lot of them just gather in hallways, between buildings, on rooftops. Give me another picture. This is the church. This is in a 98% Muslim country. And these people are getting baptized in a muddy river in the midst of potential persecution and life death threats for sure, for sure. And this is this is packet, this is your brothers and sisters in Christ. Your brothers and sisters in Christ. So when I think about mission. I think about when I enter into the kingdom of God and Jesus Christ is my Lord, I I lose the privilege to self-govern my life, to define my life on my terms. That when I took the yoke of Christ, I took a yoke that obligates me on some level to the less fortunate around the world and to my brothers and sisters. Now, I think you heard last week where the, the girl that had been in prison for nine years... Christian girl in Pakistan was imprisoned for eight or nine years because she drank a cup of water in the fields that she was working from a Muslim man, and they imprisoned her for eight or nine years. And, and, they, and, they, and then they trumped up charges, blasphemy charges. And she just got out. She just got out after years and years of people praying around the world. She just got out. The, the, the two men, two men, one in, in the department of whatever, uh, had become vocal and said that he would, he would try to change blasphemy laws, and he was assassinated. And another one stood up and said, I'm going to see that she gets freed, and he got assassinated. Yeah, that's a price, man. I mean, we're talking mission costs. It costs people, costs heart, costs time. It costs everything. It's like Jesus. It cost him everything to come here. And you and, I get to, you and I get to freely participate. And when you talk about mission, let's just talk about a couple verses here that I think really encapsulate the whole thing. And they, and they really, um, uh, you can find this throughout all, you know, the Gospels, the book of Acts. You see the same motif happening here. Matthew chapter 10. These 12 Jesus sent out. What's community? 12. He said 12. Sent 12. That's community. You, you see the thread through Scripture that, that Jesus doesn't do things alone. Ministry is not supposed to be alone. 
You're not supposed to be lone rangers. I mean, sometimes people go alone because nobody will go with them. Tip the hat to those people. But the norm is a community of people doing the work of God in the world of God. And he said 12, and he sent them out, and that's mission right there. With the following instructions. Don't go among the Gentiles or enter any town of the Samaritans. Go. How many of you know two-thirds of God's name is go? I know. That was so bad. That, I know. That was bad. I know. I know. That Bad, bad, huh? That was, that, you love it? Thank you. But it was bad, trust me. <laughs> go rather the lost sheep of Israel. As you go, as you go, proclaim this message. message. The kingdom of heaven has come near. What is the kingdom of heaven? The range of God's effective will. It's what God wants done gets done. Amen. That's what we think. We don't think, once again, we say, come to church. Jesus says, go be the church. The called out ones to people. It's always that way. We've kind of twisted that. We've inverted that. He's always saying, go. Jesus is always saying, come to me. And then he's always saying, go to them. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. Jesus is saying, love people enough that you'll enter into their broken world. If you don't enter in, and I don't enter into people's brokenness, we've obligated ourselves to stereotype them. If you don't enter in, into the, to the life of a homeless person, then you just judge them and say, they're lazy, they don't work. And I've done that before. But then you get in, you start to know stories. Or you, 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 you talk to a prostitute, and you just go, there's just a, a, a loose woman there that just wants to make money. And you enter into the story, and you find all the brokenness she came from, family brokenness. And then all of a sudden, that person has a face, and that person has a heart, and that person has a future, and that person has a destiny, and that person has a love by God that wants to be bestowed on them. And meanwhile, the church stands back and says, look at them. Pathetic. Don't be pathetic. Seriously, don't be pathetic. Man, ask God to just open your heart, man. Do some surgery. Cut it open. God, take it out. Do something with it. Don't let it stay numb. Don't, don't let it stay dark. Don't let it stay preoccupied with self. Bring some people into my life that will just mess me up. Seriously. I mean, two days ago, yesterday. Yeah, yesterday. Driving through a parking lot, there's a guy, he's got a sign, homeless. My first thought is, dude, you're, you're in the trunk of a Toyota Corolla that's newer than my car. Bad attitude, drive on by. Then I'm thinking, should I have had a bad attitude? Should I have helped him? So I drove, and I was just kind of challenged and disturbed. I didn't get any clarity, like, go back, you know. It was like God saying, yeah, I'm going to just let you sit with this for a while. <laughs> sit with this disturbed feeling. <laughs> feel a little guilty. You know, we want to remove guilt, don't we? It's like, oh, don't feel guilty, brother. I say feel guilty. Yeah. Seriously, don't be condemned. God's not rubbing your nose, my nose, in my failures. But guilt's not a bad thing. So I felt a little guilty. I thought, man, gee, I hope I get a do-over on that one. That's just bad. Yeah, should I? Maybe not. You know what? The guy might be making a ton of money. He doesn't need my money. So then today I'm coming, I'm coming in, and I have a ritual when I speak. I come here at 7 o'clock, not a minute too late. And I have my coffee and my blueberry oatmeal. It's just my deal. And my wife made me one cup of coffee, and I stopped for another cup of coffee. From 7 to 8, it's this cup of coffee. 8 to 9, it's that cup of coffee. You don't deviate. Don't deviate. That's the plan. You come in, you put worship on, you look at your notes, notes you obsess over your notes. You go a little nutty, and I'm driving down the road here, and there's this homeless lady. And I look, that's sad. If I can't be real, then forget the whole thing, man, because, you know, I know none of you would ever say that, but I just said, that's sad. I drove, but it's one minute till. I got one minute to get all my stuff up to my office so I can obsess and do a good job and got my coffee. And then all of a sudden I get to the church. I think, really, man? Oh, gosh, really? 
This is the do-over from two days ago, man. And it's cold. So I remember, I got new gloves right there because I have sensitive hands. <laughs> got to have gloves in NorCal. My wife got them for me. It's like they, and so they're, they're stuck in the little deal there. And I'm not going to use them, but they're there just in case it gets cold. So I go, and there she is, and I roll the window down. And I said, hey, do you want some new gloves? Yes. And then there's the coffee. Now, I don't know why a $2 cup of coffee was bigger to me than a $15 pair of gloves, but it was. And I thought, I haven't taken, uh. I said, would you like some coffee? I'd love some. Okay. <laughs> Isn't that just pathetic? That's just pathetic. And I said, hey, can I pray for you? Yes. I'm like, wow. It's the trifecta, man. It's like, you want my car? <laughs> Take my car. You don't know what's going to happen out there. So I prayed. I just prayed this great prayer. She said, thank you very much. I said, enjoy the coffee. And I went my way. You know what that took? That took nothing. It took, here's my point. Most of what you think mission is, isn't. You think it's going to cost me thousands and millions of dollars. And it may. And I hope it does. I do. I hope God says, empty it all out. Sell it all. Sell it all. Sell the house, everything. Your little Contigo mug, too. Get rid of that thing. Yeah. I was going to say you're going styrofoam, but he doesn't want that either. It's the planet thing. So when Jesus said, follow me, he is saying, enter in to my presence. And in my presence, you're going to find purpose. Because your life as you know it, when the kingdom of God breaks in and comes to, is over. Once again, play church. Yeah, go to church. You can do all that. Sure, go sign up for another, yet another study. Sure. Not bad. He's after a lot more. After the whole thing, man. The whole life. And everything you are, everything you have, he wants all of it. And you know why we're so uncomfortable and restless? <laughs> oh, gosh, what time is it? I can get out of here in 11 minutes. <clears throat> reason we're so restless is we're still hanging on to stuff that he wants. I'm just saying. That's at least for me. Maybe not you. Not this section over here. They're not giving up nothing. I meant like it. Forget. I know. I don't know why. I love these guys. My son's there. I love him. I <laughs> love him. So he said, he said, he's saying, follow me, enter in, my presence, my purpose, and this is a good one, and my suffering. Wow, what doesn't sell a lot of CDs these days? <laughs> my five-part set on suffering. Nah. How about the blessing? How about the seven steps to being blessed by God? Yeah, sign me up. You know what, Paul? Paul prayed this disturbing prayer in Philippians. Here's what he said. That I might know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. This is no joke. I kid you not. In my Bible, I had the first part underlined and highlighted that I might know him and the power of his resurrection. And then I stopped when it got to the suffering part. Because you know what I want? I want power without suffering. And you know the problem with people that have power without suffering? You can't trust them. Selah. <laughs> you can't. Now, somebody that walks with a limp, somebody that has suffered, typically is humble. And people, and I tell you how you know these people, they're willing to do the menial, not just the majestic. I met a lot of people, they want big stuff. God, give me the big stuff. Give me the power. Give me the power. You know what? Grab a broom. We don't want to, eh, forget that. I'm going to move on because a bad attitude is right around the corner. Um, <laughs> See, first service is a keeper, so 
This is a keeper? Oh, God. <laughs> edit, edit, edit. <laughs> I talked to my friend. We're talking, once again, we're talking about entering into the suffering, man. Entering into the suffering. That's why a lot of people don't go to those places. Because your heart gets affected. And see, and then you come to this place called the end of yourself. Awkward place. Where it's like you realize that person's got nothing. I don't really know what to do here. And I'm praying some little prayer that sounds good, but I'm not sure there's any power behind it. Get me out of here. I want to go home. Suffering is like, God, I don't know what to do here. Just give me one thing, one nugget. Just anything. Just give me something to do here. That's where you find the grace of God, at the end of yourself. Not at the beginning. Not in your intentions. Not in the, oh, this is what I'm going to do. In the, I have no clue what to do. But in my weakness, your strength is made perfect. That's the truth. I talked to a friend of mine two nights ago. Missionary Malaysia, gritty guy. Hey, what are you up to? Well, got back a couple weeks ago from Indonesia after the tsunami. I said, really, what would you do? He said, I retrieved dead bodies for a week. I said, whoa. Really? Yeah. He goes, every day. Just unearthed people. Said at the nine-day mark, found one person alive. Nine days, one person, a lot of dead bodies. He goes, so that's what I did during the day. And at night, I stayed in the tent city with the people and just loved on their trauma. They're all traumatized. They're all Muslim. And he said, I'm going to share the gospel. Anybody who wants to come, listen. I'll be right over there. 300 Muslims come and hear the gospel. They said, he's talking about Jesus. They all flocked over there. Now, let me just tell you something, man. It's hot. It's sweaty. It's stinky. They didn't have enough food. They didn't have enough water. You got traumatized people walking around like zombies that have lost family, family members. They have no houses, no huts, no no, no nothing. He's right in the middle of it. And then I think about my little coffee story. Probably not going to share that with him. <laughs> yeah. You get around those kind of missionaries, you just don't share a lot. Of, you just listen. You just listen. <laughs> listen. Can you pray for me? <laughs> Humbling. Well, what's it look like? Here's a great quote. There's only one thing worse than being lost, and that is being lost and have no one trying to find you. Mm -hmm. Here's a picture of my friend Tommy. This guy was like the biggest jerk. <clears throat> he had a gift of antagonizing. I mean, seriously, he would, he would embarrass anybody. I worked with him. And I worked at the airlines, and it was fun because I was newly saved and had my little Gideon's Bible. <laughs> and we had to sit on this tractor waiting for planes to come, and then we'd unload them. And he was just foul-mouthed, just dirty. And I'd pull out my Bible, start reading about Jesus and hell. <laughs> I just you know, I just read. What do you think that means right there? It's highlighted. It's underlined. Weeping and gnashing of teeth. What do you think that means? I'm just telling you. And, and, but I liked him. That's what was funny. People couldn't stand him. And he was, he was a handful, but I liked the guy. And his locker was right next to mine. And he had all the dirty pictures, and he put them in my face. And I had little religious books. Read that. Read that. And, and it was good. I mean, it was absolutely awesome. And lost track of him, got into ministry, moved. I was telling a bunch of friends that were over on a Sunday night. We were eating dinner. I was telling about this guy, what a crazy guy he was, what a zany guy he was. And I was just a jerk and everything. They said, what's he doing? I said, I have no idea. I haven't talked to him. They said, you ought to, you ought to look him up. So I said, that's back when they had information. A lot of you don't know who that is. But this is a lady on the other line. Information. Yeah, I'm trying to find Tom Emmons in Des Moines. One minute. Here's the number. The number you have requested. And you get the number. And so I just called this guy. They said, call him now. So I call him. I, answer machine comes on. I go, hey, Tom, what are you doing, man? I haven't talked to you in a long time. I was telling a bunch of friends about what a jerk you were. And 
da 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 man, we need to get together, we need to hang out, let's, come on, let's have some coffee, let's go out for dinner, whatever, call me back, here's my number. You had to leave your number. You want an answer machine. You had to leave your number. Well, I hang up, that's it, you know. I get a call back a couple hours later. Here's the story. This guy was walking around a high school track by his apartment contemplating suicide because he was addicted to cocaine. And in his desperation, before he went home, he said, God, I need a sign. I need you to give me a sign. I need you to give me a sign if you're real. Goes back to his apartment. Hey, Tom, what are you doing? <laughs> you ask for a sign from God and you get Bob. But Sometimes that's all God has to work with, right? <laughs> Seriously. And you know, I think, about, I think about that story. I went up to Washington and baptized my nephew a few months ago. Him and I connected again. You know, he's been free from a long time. Addiction back in the day. You know, he got baptized. He would drive an hour to come to my church. We baptized him. He married a great lady. He's been free of everything, including social media for years. He doesn't even go there. And you know what? God used me, humble me, you know? And that's what he wants to do with you. So I wonder, what would happen if you prayed and just said, God, who's praying? And I have the answer. Or I am the answer. Sometimes it's not what you say or what you give. It's just your presence. That's really all sometimes people need. And you know what's interesting? After that, at the end of that verse, he says, freely you have received. Freely give. When was the last time you inventoried all the goodness and graces that God gave you? I mean, you think about it, you know, man, if we, if we had time and we just said, what, what, what has God given you freely? You, you and I would come up with about 50 to 100 things. And then he's saying, whatever you freely received, just freely give it. Just be a dispenser of the grace of God. Kingdom of heaven, the range of God's effective will. What does God want done? He says, pray, your kingdom come. This is how Jesus, when the disciples said, teach us to pray, as John taught his disciples to pray. Jesus said, pray, thy kingdom come, your will be done. And he said, seek first the kingdom of God, the rule and reign. I've got to have the rule and reign of Jesus in my life first before I go out there. He wants to rule. He wants 100% of me. He doesn't want 98, 95. It's Sunday, I've got to preach. My prayers are more intense. He doesn't want that. He wants it all, full time. He wants us to go full-time. And you know what seek first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness was? That was the antidote to worry. It's Matthew 6, you know, it's all, it's all about, you know, people worrying about what they have, what they don't have, provisions, all that kind of stuff. And you know what the answer was? Seek first the kingdom. And you'll be so preoccupied with the rule and reign of God that you'll have whatever you need. And you won't even really be aware of it. I mean, that's what we're called to do. Let's stand up together so you think you're getting out of here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think about, you ever heard of the Moravian missionaries? People in the Czech Republic, man, these were these young people. They prayed 24-7. There's about 300 people, and they took turns praying 24-7. It went on for years and years and years. And they had a zeal for missions, and so they sent missionaries. There's two young guys in their 20s that heard about a plantation owner in the West Indies. And they said, you know what? We want to go reach those guys. So they sent letters to him. The guy said, no Christian is going to come here. Nobody's going to talk about God. Da -da 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 -da. So these two young missionaries in their 20s sold themselves into slavery so they could reach the slaves in the West Indies on the plantation. That's amazing. Where do you get that? Well, freely you've received, freely give. And that's what Jesus did, man. He entered our broken world. He entered into our mess. He entered into everything to set us free, to redeem us, to liberate us, to make things right. The righteousness of God is about rightness. It's about alignment. It's about justice. It's about shalom. And just, you know, I'm just going to go through this list real quick as we leave. What would a city, a home, a family, a church, a village, or a country look like if the kingdom of God was manifested? Just imagine, just dream, expand, enlarge your heart. Just think about this for a minute. You would see peace and reconciliation. You would see the end of racism, sexism, ageism, and crime. 
you would see people forgiving one another. You know what I would say? How many of you have ever had to forgive someone? You know how you know you've really forgiven someone? This is just what I think about. I really know that I've forgiven someone completely when I can pray that God blesses them and they do get blessed and I'm actually happy. That's, that's what forgiveness is to me. You can say, I forgive you. Sure, those are good words. It's a good start. But I know that when my heart rejoices because you got blessed, and at the front end, I don't really like you, you would see justice for all. I mean, there's just something wrong. 9.5 million people in sex trafficking around the world. It's just, it's wrong. It's just wrong. The kingdom of God needs to go there, needs to be there. Compassion and mercy, freedom from oppression, deliverance from bondage, kingdom manifested would see naked people clothed, would see poor people fed. Once again, you know what's troubling about poor and poverty? There's 2,000 verses in Scripture. If there was only 20, you could kind of pretend you didn't see them. 2,000, man. You don't have to go a few pages without, oops, there it is again. Called to do something about it. Jesus was saying, you're part of my story, whether you realize it or not. Because when I was hungry, you fed me. When I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. When I was in prison, you came and visited me. You'd see the sick cared for and healed. You know, hospitals were started by churches. You know that, right? That's, how they, that's the origin. Started by churches. You'd see deliverance from Satan's power and allegiance to Jesus Christ displayed. I want to pray. They surveyed they surveyed Christians, and they asked this question. They said, if there was a reputable organization that ministered to the children of parents who died with AIDS, and it was a legit organization, would you give to it? 52% said no. And I just, I just think about that for a minute. They didn't say give. They said, would you be willing to give? And 52%. I'll just tell you this right now. Whatever Jesus they think they have, they got the wrong Jesus. And whatever book they're reading, they're not reading that book. All right. I got to stop. This won't be good for us. (laughs) Put a hand on a heart. Aaron says to do that a lot, so it must be good. It's the center of our being, our feeling, our thinking. It's all right down here. It was a compliment. Oh. If your heart's perfect, you're dismissed. So, Father, you see this heart, and boy, you see it. You know it. You know, your word says you know the thoughts and the intents of our heart. You even know what we're thinking about. And you see the condition it's in, and you know exactly what to do with it. And so I ask you, God, for those that have a real hard heart, a calloused heart, I pray that they would have an encounter with the Spirit of God, an encounter with the mercy of God, an encounter with the peace of God, an encounter with the love of God. God, I pray that you would open our eyes to see what you see. I pray that we would not be afraid of the suffering word. I pray that we would not be afraid to feel what you feel for lost, broken humanity for the afflicted, for the people that we don't even know what we would say, what we would do. You do know what to do. You do know what to say. And we're in you, and you're in us, and I pray that you would help us, God. God, help this church be known for courage, not fear. God, for love, never hate. Compassion, never callousness. Generosity, never stinginess. And so, God, I just pray we just... Bring our hearts before you right now and ask you to transform it and change it and bring life to it and remind us that when our life is changed, we freely receive from you. Help us freely give. In the name of Jesus and all God's people said, amen. Amen. If you need prayer, get on up here. Church, I love you. You're dismissed.